I don't think of myself as a collector at all. I have bought work over many years. I think the first work I bought was just because I liked how it looked. I'm much more a casual collector, if you want to call it, because I don't wake up in the morning and think today I'm going to go out and buy something. So if I happen to go to an exhibition or something and I see something I like, then I might buy it if it's within my price range. But I don't think I could be considered at all among, you know, KL's major collectors. I just like art. And you nominated me as a collector. Most of the work that I have my collection, mostly I know the artists and usually it's because of we exchange artwork or example the work for the colour by Jai is an exchange for a piece I edited for him, a writing piece I edited for him. What else? <laughs> or some student, he was artist at Rimbun Jahan and I wrote the essay for his catalogue. So instead of getting the payment, he gave me a work. Same with Manit, yeah. I did portraits for a portrait show at Valentine Willie. I did portraits of him too. And I also curated his exhibition in Chimati. He asked me to choose which I would like. So I like the Pink Man in Meditation. Usually it's quite large format, light box. So he did a smaller version for me, but it's nice. One of the earliest works I bought was a drawing from uh, Yao Biling, pastel drawing, a very beautiful piece of um, family at the dining table. And of course, at that time, I had no idea she is. She's just a young artist that just graduated. But she went on to do some really wonderful works. I do like sculpture because I remember in the university where I was, there were these massive sculptures that I love to look at. They were very, very large and of course take a lot of space and I suppose I never thought to own one. I happened to see some wonderful stone sculptures from a German artist uh, in Kuala Lumpur many years ago. I just really admired the way the artist had gone all the way to Ipoh, got a chunk of marble and sort of crafted the piece and to imagine the hard work you know of actually doing it i thought the the whole making of the work i think speaks to me as well i think that was the first sculpture i bought i think it's because i had a friend who owned a gallery uh may wan wong may wan and that was a while ago more than 30 years ago i think but i guess my first major purchase was Wong Hoi Cheong, this big piece at her gallery, which I really love because it's so bright and colorful. And it was a reasonable price, I thought, because it was big and it just spoke to me. So I bought it and I still have it. And that all set me off on the path, you know, of, of looking properly at, at art. I fell in love and I went to Berlin. <laughs> Then when I was in Berlin, even before I went to art school, I was always going to galleries uh, in Berlin at that time. This is Berlin in the 80s and the 90s. I started yeah, buying books from the gallery, like artists that I like. It was a print of Graceland and I bought it because my dad is a big fan of Elvis Presley. So it's a German artist doing Graceland. Hi! <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, Suzy Pop, which is a conceptual artist. If you go to suzypop.com, you'll find out more. Very mysterious, don't know who she or he is. I can't remember, but I, it was affordable. I, I was not rich because uh, at that time I was working part-time as a cleaning lady. I also renovated the apartment, so it, it wasn't expensive. It was affordable. It has to be beautiful, but it also has to have a clear story about what it wants to say, whether it's about, for instance, the material. In selecting a piece of work, I also want it to be well crafted. I think there is art in the mastering of a technique, whether it's painting or drawing or a sculpture. There is first a mastery of the medium. And um, I think that's similar to architecture as well. You need to know how to put things together. And only, I believe, when you have mastered that craft, can you actually produce something that will be art because it's well crafted. I wish I could say I was much more of a curious collector. I see something I like, it speaks to me, and then I get it. But I did make a decision a while ago that I would buy Malaysian women artists simply because I thought that they needed more 
help, more support. And I didn't think that they were getting the encouragement uh, that they should have. And this turned out to be true because uh, a few years ago, my group, Sisters, we wanted to do an all-women art show to sell as a fundraiser. And then we were told that we should include some male artists because that's what sells. So I thought, oh, okay, that really illustrates the situation. So I, I, I do stick quite strongly to that approach. Uh, of buying women. As an artist, <laughs> you have this network of friends or you know the shows that you create and you build friendships. When I look at the world, not only I look at the world, but I remember the person behind the world and the friendship I had. I know several artists that who I didn't know before, but when I saw the work, I feel maybe a connection with me, even if I don't know them. I buy work that speaks to me, I guess. Well, similarly, when a collector once asked me if he should buy somebody's work, but the value, and said, look, if you like the work, the value is priceless. <laughs> uh, no, actually, because I think I buy the work because I want to keep it, um, to enjoy it, or as a gift sometimes. But most of the time, I buy it for my own pleasure. Sometimes it fits the space, but that's of course uh, secondary. I think it's most of the time you buy a work and then look for a space for it. I don't buy with the intention to sell. In fact, I've never resold any work so far. I bought them because they give me joy. And if I sold them, that'd be a gap in, in my life. I guess I'm sentimental about them. So I like having them out there where I can see them because I don't think what's the point, you know? I mean, it is bought for pleasure to me. It's visual pleasure. So it should be somewhere where it can be seen. But having said that, I do still have some still wrapped up and under bubble wrap and things like that. And just trying to find the space, basically. No, I wouldn't consider selling the artworks. In, that's in my collection. They're too precious. They all have stories behind them. I wish that the art industry made artwork more accessible for people who would want to have the work, not necessarily for collectors who would you know, amass artwork that you need a warehouse to keep them and air condition them and all that. There seem also many collectors who are very willing to pay very premium prices for very famed artists. But that creates an opportunity, I think, for uh, people who may have a good eye and able to see good work uh, of unknown artists. Perhaps I think that there is uh, quite a lot of uh, opportunity to find potentially great work from young artists not yet known, who would be known one day. Just like some of the works when I got them, they were actually unknown at that time. And by now, I can't afford to buy the work. It always kind of bugs me where people think that it's, it's a luxury almost, you know? I mean, for the people doing the art, it's not a luxury. It's, it's what they live on. But I really think that, you know, we, we, we need it very much. We should be educating people. I'm so amazed I see school groups at the Tate Modern and all that, and they're there with their sketchbooks, and the teachers are there and they're explaining all these paintings. And they're not just looking at children-friendly art, they're looking at everything, you know? And, but understanding the, like here, you know, if you put a nude up, everyone goes, oh my God. You know, it's obscene. Whereas there, they would explain it more. Oh yes, I am optimistic about the Malaysian visual art. Because not visual art, I think word it that it's not about optimism. I'm curious because through the lockdown, there's a lot of work that's been selling online. So, and I do know from my experience, like when we send photos or slides for competitions, usually, you know, some work looks better on slide or graphically stronger and some beautiful works, they look bad on slides. So I think it would kind of change also the perspective of how people see artwork. Mostly, I guess, people get attracted to something that will jump out online, I guess. And then with the whole NFT thing, which is something new, I'm quite curious about that too. So I've got baskets from perhaps 
30 different countries just to appreciate the craft and the local materials that they use in like a normal basket that they use to buy vegetables and fruit everywhere you know every country will have their own bags and baskets that very local and I enjoy that some of them are usually very inexpensive they usually bear the hallmark of like the local tradition of crafting or weaving it. Similarly with the artwork, I think. The trouble is I'm very shy and when I meet an artist, I frequently don't know what to talk to them about. I don't know what to ask them. I am often very shy to ask them what their painting is all about. Singing. <laughs> Actually, I had a band and we did perform. Yeah. I was a singer. No, my career, my singing career is over. <laughs>